Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can I welcome you all today to uh, today's meeting of the Public uh, Petitions Committee? And uh, as always, can I ask everyone to switch off any electronic devices because it does uh, interfere with our sound systems. Um, we've had <coughs> apologies from Trick Brody, who's uh, unwell, and can I welcome Jim Eady, um, who's the substitute. Uh, thank you, Jim, for coming along to substitute for uh, Trick Brody. Um, agenda item one, decision on taking business in private. The first item of business seeks the committee's agreement to take ag agenda item four, the draft note of decision stating the business planning discussion in private. Does the committee agree to take this item in private? Thank you for that. Uh, agenda item two, consideration of new petitions. The next item of business is consideration of four new petitions. The committee invite the petitioners to speak to three of the petitions. The first new petition is PE1523 by Jess Smith on giving the Tinker's Heart for Gail back to travelling people. Me uh, Members of a note by the clerk, the spice briefing and the, and the petition. Could I welcome Jess Smith? Thank you very much for coming along. You're very welcome. And also Mike Russell, who's the constituency MSP, who's had a great interest in this particular petition. And can ask if Jess Smith could speak to the petition of a maximum of five minutes. Uh, that will be followed by a contribution from Mike Russell. I'll kick off with some questions. I invite my colleagues to have some questions. And then we'll uh, summarise and look at the next steps for your petition. Jess Smith, thanks very much for coming along. Thank you, David. In 2010, I was informed that the Tinker's Heart of Quartz Stone at the junction of Hells Glen on the road to Strachar was almost destroyed due to neglect and cattle trampling over it. My husband and I went to see for ourselves, and when I saw the state of the place, a knot formed like a stone in my stomach, and it was like witnessing the death knell of an entire culture. The travelling folk whose families came from the area, and many of those who had left, believed that it was indestructible, a living monument. Nothing or no one would interfere with the place. Locals were proud to say it was in their part of Argyll, and it served as a church to those who went there, some to baptise babies, others to get married, and those to die. The Little Heart was all the travellers had, an ancient place, and nobody has discovered its roots. It's believed that the lads of the cow who didn't return from the battlefield of Claude Moore were remembered by their families by placing a white quartz stone on the ground overlooking Loch Fine, and this was in the shape of a heart. And there are those who say it was appropriate to place the stones there because it is believed that on the ancient spot stood a Celtic church. A standing stone is supposed to have towered on the spot but was destroyed and the stones arranged to indicate where it stood because we really don't know its history. In 1808, at the construction of roads, it lay there undisturbed. The builders worked around it, making certain they did not interfere with it. In 1928, Lady George Campbell protested at a meeting of Cowell District Committee against any interference of the heart, which at times became covered in grass. That part she held was of historical and sentimental interest, as it was known from time immemorial to have been the place where the wedding ceremony of Tinkers took place. The Reverend John McCorkindale from Loch Goylehead officiated at ceremonies there. Travellers, some with horses and carts, others with small prams, and the foot soldiers visited year after year and they knew him well. It was their place to go, to be reinstated with the earth. There was also a tramp man who built a small hut down the road part ways to Cairndrew and it said he watched over the heart for many a year. Now, allow me to read this letter to you. It was addressed to the headmaster of Ferryden School, Montrose. His name was Mr. White. He wrote to Betsy White, congratulating her on the publication of Yellow on the Broom. And this is her reply. Dear Mr. White, your letter was a delightful surprise. Of course we remember you, but can hardly believe that you are retired. The years have slipped past so stealthily. One of my most ple pleasant memories of Ferry Den was of you. It was the day of the Queen's coronation and the weather had become rather nasty, so the children's fancy dress parade was held in the Scouts Hall. I was standing behind you and the other officials and I heard you say, I think the Sheik and his wife are the best dress Burns. However, the councillor said to you, Och, but that's the Tinks and you can't pick them. The children were my daughter and her cousin, so I turned away feeling rather depressed. To think that those educated men had so little sense. Then imagine my surprise when I heard you say, and I can remember your exact words, I don't think anyone can dispute that the Sheik and his wife are the best dressed Burns, and I truly admired your courage. And during your stay in Ferry Den, there was no discrimination nor segregation of the traveller children. 
Now, you might want to ask, what does the traveller culture have to do with Celtic or any other piece of Scottish history? Well, as the Battle of Culloden was in 1746, you may want to read Robert Burns's address from Beelzebub to the head of the Highland Society, who wanted a certain Lord Glengarry who was successful in murdering and scattering 500 Glengarry Highlanders. And when the pie-coated gentleman of Edinburgh invited him to pen the poem, Burns, who was the great-grandson of Walter Campbell of Lorne, a strong Jacobite, spat fire when he said, I'll, I'll write it, but no for me. Only the devil would sup with sick a chill, and I'll do him the honour. And this poem was penned in 1786, long before the clearances, and only 40 years after Culloden. And here's one verse. And get a horsewhip and a jowler, the lang is thang, the fierce is growler, and gar the tattered gypsy packs, we ah, their bees on their backs. Burns's ancestral roots were so strong, he followed his heart, and he showed immense courage. Lady Campbell, when she took on the Cowell Council, she too showed courage. I can imagine the look of surprise on the faces of those councillors when she may have thumped the table and insisted the old heart be protected. There is no doubt her re request would have seen eyebrows raised when she demanded, no, let the tinkers keep their heart. A very courageous gesture from such a prestigious or gaucher lady. And when the Reverend John McCorkendale ignored the might of the Church of Scotland and carried his Bible under his arm and gave his time to baptise the travelling baby, give comfort, to the relatives of the deceased and blessed the union of a young couple heading on their journey of marriage, he too showed courage. For that is what the Reverend portrayed, because if his masters had discovered he was officiating outside the house of God, he may well have lost his position and his manse. Every day a young traveller steps inside school. He or she knows that at any time they could be subjected to bullying. They are aware that their right to an education is theirs, a gift from the country of their birth. Their parents and grandparents suffered the same discrimination. The youngsters could take the easy way out and stop schooling, and who could blame them? But they desperately want an education to go to university and fulfil their dreams. So they bite their tongues and they live with verbal and physical abuse, and that takes a lot of courage. The heart to these young people is so much more than a monument. It's an indicator of what they believe is their culture. It represents a future, a place to visit and say, we are part of this country and we can make a difference. Let us remain proud of our ancestors because they kept our dreams for equality alive. They travelled to this little place in all weathers and we'd like to say thank you. And the only way we know how is to fight for the Tinker's Heart of Argyll to be scheduled and protected by historic Scotland. And we now invite them to show some courage. Th thank you very much. That's a very interesting presentation and I really appreciate you coming along and talking to the committee today. Can I ask if Mike Bussell would has add his contribution? Thank you very much, convener, and thank you to the committee for hearing this petition. I, I want just to start by paying tribute to Jess Smith, who I'm very proud to call a friend now. We've been working on this for a, a number of years, and I'm quite certain it will have success. It will have success not only because of Jess's determination, because of all those people behind her, and some of whom are here today, who feel very passionately that it is about time that we recognise the contribution of the travelling people of Scotland uh, to our nation in two ways. Both to recognise the historic contribution they made, and Jess has outlined that very strongly, but also to, in a sense, reconcile that contribution into the modern day. Uh, this is the only physical artefact that we can associate with the travelling people. There is no other physical artefact in Scotland that has the association. And in those circumstances, it, it forms a unique contribution to our heritage, both tangible and intangible. And convener, if I can just mention in passing the Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage, passed by UNESCO in October 2003, uh, came into force in 2006, still not ratified by successive UK governments but an important contribution to understanding this whole issue, that history is not just about places, it is not just about buildings, it is also about the intangible, it is about the cultural contribution that comes from all groups within the community. And this remarkable artefact brings those two things together. It doesn't matter too much whether it has always been in exactly the same place. It doesn't matter too much, as your briefing paper indicates, that it might have had more stones in it at one stage. It is a vitally important symbol of the contribution of a very important group to Scotland. And in these circumstances, we should do everything we can to preserve it 
and to enhance its meaning and its availability. And I want to make that point very strongly, convener. Uh, the monument at the moment, and I want to call it a monument, is not scheduled, and it should be. And the scheduling can take place because I don't think Historic Scotland have given enough weight to the Convention on the Intangible Heritage. And I think they could do so to make an exception in this case to schedule it. In those circumstances, they also want to put proactively, uh, along with others, including our Island Butte Council, bring into this the landowner who really needs to be focused and involved on this, and to bring in the community who need to be focused and involved in this, to do three important things. One is to increase physical access. The monument stands in a field at a very awkward road junction where parking is dangerous. There is the availability of a piece of old road next to it, which would provide access and parking. Secondly, there needs to be significant signage. There is one very small inadequate sign, and there is a proposal by uh, the landowner and their family to have further information provided at a community information point three miles distant. That is contrary to all good practice. There should be good, substantial, well-designed signage on the site that explains the significance of this spot and the significance to the travelling people. To, to Jess herself, whose grandmother was born not so far from it, Am I right? Your mother. Your mother born on the shore, down below it, you know, in, in a story that needs to be told about how people lived and travellers lived in Argyle. And the third thing is maintenance, that there needs to be an arrangement put in place that cleans it up. It's presently surrounded by a metal container, which I think is, is whilst I think it's improvement on what was there, is, is by no means a, a, a best practice. Uh, it should be maintained and looked after in a way that speaks of its importance. I've been delighted to work with Jess and others on this. It's unfinished business in terms of the travelling people, but also in Argyll. And it would draw many, many people to a part of Argyll that really doesn't uh, draw as many as it should, so that they can understand the importance of this community. Community, just to finish, when I was very much younger, I saw uh, families of travellers living on the sewers of Loch Fyne. Um, that no longer takes place but the area is redolent of the contribution, the very productive, positive contribution of the travelling people of Scotland. And I feel extremely strongly that this should now be recognised properly by the landowner, by Historic Scotland, by the Scottish Government, by all of us as a community, so we can move forward. Uh, could I thank Mike Russell very much for that? That was both the, in the philosophy and the practical steps that we perhaps can be helpful here. And certainly on a personal view, I'm... I'm I'm going to a guy to think during the recess, so uh, I'll certainly make sure that I visit uh, uh, the heart when I'm there. And uh, thank you for drawing it not to, just to my uh, uh, views, but also to the whole committees as well. So just to be clear then, on the practical steps, um, it would be useful then if you could get the monument scheduled in the technical term and then get Historic Scotland uh, to class it as a scheduled ancient monument and to look at restoration and preservation. So that would be the first practical step. How would you describe your approaches to historic Scotland so far? We met them once in the uh, council, Bill H. Kilmory, and I felt that we were there to discuss the heart, but I've, I felt by the, the way that the procedures went that the person uh, from historic Scotland had already made up his mind, and it was a bit negative. Um, I, I would have loved to have went into, com you know, into conversation with them because a lot of times and what we really need to do, and Mike touched on this, is to educate people about what up until this present day has been. Um, people who were kept to themselves, they were oralists, you know, they shared the stories and the songs. Hamish Henderson uh, would t tell you that. And um, really the history of Scotland went from campfire to campfire, but it was never, ever written down. So I have attempted, you know, to write as much as I could in six books, and um, but but we really need a lot more history. We need the young to be involved in this. We need them to get their respect back for their culture, and you know, before it, it drifts away into the mists of time. So it would be helpful then, if the committee obviously agrees to this, to put a very strong representation to Historic Scotland, perhaps the Scottish Government as well. Um, it would seem sensible to contact Gallen Butte Council and the, the landowner, would that be a sensible practical steps? Yes, um, what, what we have come, it's four years now I've, I've been fighting for this and campaigning. 
um, with lots of other people's help. And um, what I found with the landowner is she seems to have made up her mind, you know, that nothing is going to progress, that they're going to look after it. And, and with all respect, I say to the landowner, she'll die, I'll die, you know, we'll all die. But the, the monument, like all other monuments in Scotland, like all the war memorials, have to be preserved, it has to live on, because it's not about the living, it's about everybody, you know. It, we really have to look after it. And with all, you know, she might want to keep the little cage there and, and, you know, as access is. But as I say, it could change any minute. It has to be more, you know, more, more cemented. And as Mike Russell said, this is also a great opportunity to develop tourism as well in Agyland Butte, which is such a beautiful area. Yeah, yeah. I, I, being an author, I've spent some time in many parts of the world, Australia, Nova Scotia, you know, New Zealand, and people from, that have come from the culture, you know, several generations ago, but have not taken their birth coat off, are very proud of who they are, um, they want to come. This is, we, we want to go back to Scotland, you know, the place of our, our ancestors' birth, but where do we go? You know, they travelled, we know they travelled around Argyle, we know they travelled around Persia, they were very clannish, very much like the clans, but where did they go? And, and I believe, you know, if our Guile and Butte Council would just show a little bit of, um, you know, oversight and say, well, let, let, yeah, let's think about this. Get the wee car park, get tourists in, let them have a look, let them enjoy Loch Fine, let them enjoy, let them spend their money in other parts of our Guile. And if the tourist um, industry took that on board and, and took it into their, you know, their criteria, the, the, we, we may see quite an asset for our Guile show. So, sorry, I was just going to say there's also, there is also funding available here, which they could also be accessed as well, isn't there? Thank you for that, and I throw it into questions from my colleagues. Uh, Angus MacDonald. <coughs> yes, uh, thanks, Camina. Can I say uh, at the outset um, that, that was an excellent uh, presentation, both from, from Jess and, and yourself, Mr Russell. Um, I have to um, admit to, to my shame uh, that I wasn't aware of the, the Tinker's Heart uh, until I had sight of this, this petition. Um, and I also have to admit that I was touched by the, the, the heartfelt plea um, by Jess Smith uh, for the proper recognition of, of the site. Um, it is, according to the briefing uh, that we had prior to, to, to this uh, uh, meeting, uh, it's unfortunate to say the least that uh, the landowner, uh, Kate Howe, I think, uh, seems to be less than, than supportive. Um, and. You know, clearly the issue has been brought up by the convener, but have, have you or, or any of the other uh, local politicians or uh, Mr Russell um, had any face-to-face -face meetings with Ms Howe, uh, Ms Howe with regard to... I've written to, to her, even including stamped address envelopes, but she refuses to reply, but Mike has. He has met with her. Okay. Convener, can I... Thank you. Um, I met with Kate Howe on one occasion to discuss this. Uh, to be fair to Kate Howe, she, she does say that she is very keen to make sure that the monument is preserved and the, uh, the local historical society make the same statement. But uh, with the best will in the world, they haven't got the skills uh, to, to maintain such a monument. It's simply impossible for them. Nor do they have the resources to maintain such a monument. Nor do they have the resources to improve the setting of the monument. So in all those circumstances, I think if I, if I take her at her face value, then I hope that she would cooperate with Historic Scotland, with the Royal Society of... We should have mentioned ARCAMS because they've been very positive indeed. And indeed it was ARCAMS' enthusiasm that got us really uh, pushed forward on this. It is they who, who really need to come in and help to make this matter, uh, to make it happen. Right. Thank you for that. John Wilson. Thank you very much. <coughs> Glad to hear Jess Smith keeping the oral traditions of the community alive and well, as well as putting many of the stories down in writing, because it is a tradition that people of Scotland have, should be proud of and should be well aware of in terms of the, the struggles uh, and history of the travelled people in Scotland. Uh, because, as you said, some of them have moved to other lands, but their hearts still remain uh, in Scotland. And I think this is the... Uh, whole issue about the Tinker's Heart and in your submission uh, Ms Smith you actually gave an indication that Historic Scotland uh, and your, your actual phrase is the Historic Scotland rep said they would not go against the wishes of the landowner and that worries me uh, when Historic Scotland when you clearly identify an ancient monument and Historic Scotland with the powers that they have the, the authority they have feel that they do not wish to go against the landowner's wishes. And unfortunately, uh, that type of statement uh, frightens me because it once again clearly indicates 
historic Scotland failing to understand their role in preserving uh, the history, particularly when you've got something that's a physical history of Scotland because the wishes of a landowner. Now, Mr Russell made reference to the landowner saying that she will do things to preserve the site. But does that include, and do you, do you understand it to include continued access to that, the Tinker's Heart? Because one of the main issues for me is, is the issue about continued access to the site by not only the travelling community, but by others who may wish to visit that site? Well, what she stupefied was that she didn't want to make any changes, that they'd put the, you know, to stop the cattle, because the cattle are in there, to stop the cattle tramping over it and, and um, destroying it, she, they had uh, this black cage put round about it, which is temporary, because they're big highland cattle with big horns, and they will break it down. In fact, it is dented already. And she did say that she, she only wanted a small signage on the gate. And um, when it was suggested, you know, about a, a, a little sort of kissing gate, you know, an entrance and that, they, they decided against that. They, they will look after it as it is, you know, in a cage, in a field, with cattle, without access by um, anyone. And if old people want to visit them, they can't climb the gate, you know, so. And she wanted the gate locked, but I don't think that's allowed. You know, <coughs> Scottish land rights, you cannot lock gates. It is, after all, part of the road system, which did at one time belong to the public. It's just derelict, but um, um, I, I found that she didn't want to change anything, and that's really why I'm here today, because we will all die, and, and um, we need another body to protect it and look after it. Ms Smith, you made reference to the fact that it was a public road uh, that the site stands in. I, I'm a bit bemused if it was a public road, then how do, does it, that public road now belong to a private landowner? lady here in the audience who's went to great lengths in freedom of information and um, she cannot find out when that public road went into in fact we don't know for sure who owns that we've went in great lengths the Sassin records and, and the land records and we don't know um, th there is a family called Noble one owns one estate Christina and, um, and a nephew owns another Arkin Glass and Kate Howe owns the, the neighbouring one, Arden, Arden uh, now. So we really don't know. Uh, it's just as I said, it's interesting that it wasn't a public, effectively a public highway. Yeah. And that's mm. probably the reason why it wasn't a public highway, because of the, the access routes from the different parts of Argyll uh, for people travelling through, travelling to uh, and settling there for short periods of time. So it would be interesting if we could get the Historic Scotland or whoever to actually look at that to find out when public land or public highways actually come into private ownership, uh, what conditions mm. apply to that. And you know, as Mike Russell indicated, there's quite clearly the old road that passes through it would give us some access to parking, to access to the, the site uh, without too much uh, problems. But it's clearly worrying that it's, that it's currently fenced off in a way that is not readily accessible by the community who would want to use the, the, the Tinker's Heart uh, readily and to be able to access it at all times. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, further colleagues like to ask questions? Jackson Carlow? Uh, it's a touching story. Uh, and it's quite nice to be asked to look at a monument that is a source of joy rather than one where people were sacrificed, which is where very often I find we're being asked to sort of rather luridly be uh, invited to do. Um, it doesn't seem in essence to me as if there is a huge financial demand underpinning the uh, request that you are putting, which I think is encouraging. Um, I'm just a little bit worried that we don't evolve an exaggerated expectation of of a unique tourist opportunity. I take it it's more that you see it as being one of a number of things within that immediate community around Loch Fine and everywhere else that could attract uh, tourism rather than necessarily frightening the horses slightly with talk of a major centre being built on the site or, or something of that character. Um, and it does seem to me important that we don't polarise the debate and alienate the landowner completely in the process. Uh, so, so you see it as being 
uh, an effort to underpin and preserve something which would be there when people were in the community in the area to also see and to appreciate um, and for us to do all we can to encourage the government and historic Scotland with the kind of authority of Parliament, if you like, to, to, to pursue the request with a little bit more enthusiasm and resolve. Is, yeah, is that absolutely. It? Ideally, I would love to see the landowner come on board. I would love to say, you know, gosh, this is my land. You know, what an honour that, that I have this, if, if indeed it is her land. Um, I would love to see her. I would love to see everything positive. We're not asking for Kelpie horses. We're just uh, asking for the place to be, you know, a wee dyke round about it, a nice little ornamental place and a little path into it, you know, this bit, bit for people to know you know, in the map of Scotland, that that exists and that this country actually respected the travelling culture to an extent that it went to this, you know, um, bother to do this. They actually say, right, yeah, yeah, we believe in the travellers. We know what they've given this country. Um, because Hamish Henderson did say when he was, you know, in, in living in and out of the Stuarts of Blair, gathering the ballads and singing the songs and, and enjoying it. And the School of Scottish Studies packed with the, all these stories and, and these um, visions from the past, that the travelling people were the roots of the music of Scotland, you know. I mean, my sisters could sing ballads, 20, 30 verses at age seven, you know, because it was the natural thing to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike Russell? Jackson Carlow, if I might uncharacteristically praise him, has put it particularly well on, on this occasion. There is a, an existing partnership to look after this monument, and it is a partnership of the landowner, uh, her cousin Christina, who, who runs the Here We Are uh, unit, which is where they have the interpretive material, um, uh, the noble family, and the community in Kendu. Now, I, I expressed this previously in a, in a letter in the local paper. All that is being asked for is that that partnership admits two new members, and the two new members are Historic Scotland, uh, who I think need to be part of this because they have the expertise and they have the money too, and it's not a great deal of money, and they've indicated that they would want to put something towards this. But the other part is the essential ones, the travelling people of Scotland. Uh, you know, and I think at a time when we are looking at different ways of doing things and more participation in doing things, uh, the travelling people of Scotland have to be involved in the decision-making about this site. This is theirs. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever the title deeds say or don't say, this is theirs. And they need to be part of that. Now, if those two additional partners can join in, we'll get a much enhanced site. It won't be the Disneyland of Cowell by any manner of means, uh, but it will be a place where some people will want to stop. They'll be able to stop safely, because presently it's unsafe. They'll be able to find out more about it. And standing at the top of Loch Fine, looking down at what is a magnificent view down to the shore and down the loch, they will reflect upon a number of things, including the role of the travelling people in Scotland, and that will be something that they will learn from. So it is modest in scale and scope, but it has huge significance. But the travelling people have to be part of that. Thank you for that. Does other, any other member wish to ask questions? Um, well, in so the next step, uh, Jess Smith, is we go to summation where we finished questions, but we're now looking at the next steps for the petition. And I think what I was suggesting at the start is clearly we need to do um, a note to Historic Scotland making representations uh, on, on your behalf to Scottish Government. Uh, and if the committee agrees, obviously, uh, it seems sensible to write to Gail and Butte. And um, on the point about who owns the road, I would have thought Gail and Butte are a good step to, to ask them about the ownership. Um, and also the landowner as well. So I, I'm starting to suggest that these are four practical steps, but the committee may have others. Could just ask the committee's views. Do the committee agree that these uh, we should approach these four groups, or is there anybody additional? Jackson Carroll? <coughs> I'm in agreement with that, uh, convener. I just think when we write to the council, we, which is bit, I, mean, I imagine it's kind of slightly anecdotal. I don't think we should, you know, in relation to the ownership of the yeah, yeah. road and the land, I think just a little bit cautious. I think we're asking for them for their best information yes. on it rather than yes. maybe asserting any position as yes. having been validated. Yes. I think that's a sensible point. John Wilson? The convener, if we're writing to Historic Scotland, could I suggest we ask Sc Historic Scotland to clarify what exactly their role is in preserving historic sites and monuments? Because clearly, if the, this is a historic site that we're being asked to be preserved. Uh, it's just so that we get a, a more rounded picture of how Historic Scotland see yeah. their role yes. in relation to these sites. Yeah. Because I would hate to think that we write to Historic Scotland to give us a response uh, regarding this site. Uh, whereas I would prefer to get a more uh, 
in-depth response in relation to the yeah. wider aspects of Historic Scotland and how they see their role in preserving sites and who they engage with. Yes, um, I, think that, I think that's a very sensible point. I think it goes back to the initial, initial contribution by, by Jess Smith that but then we need to ask them what the decision-making process is to make uh, the site a scheduled ancient monument, because that's the trigger under the Act, isn't it? That, would, that would, then they would have a requirement to follow this through. So I, pres and pr I presume this is a delegated power to the officers rather than ministerial, but Mike Russell can probably identify that if that's incorrect. Um, but I would certainly want that, that action to be taking place, because that triggers off powers under the Act that then opens up all sorts of other opportunities. So I think we need to be clear on that. It, it is the recognising of the culture that we have to um, press forward because I don't think enough people in authority in Scotland recognise the culture, its history and how long we've been here. <coughs> Tinkler Johnson, and I use that word with respect, is recorded in A.K. Bell Library in Perth as being a hammer man in the 12th century. You know, we are told that the travellers came here in the uh, 15th, you know, 1500s, but we have them in Scotland, you know, a lot longer. And when the Duke of Argyll in 1913 was invited by um, Mr O'Neill, a, a historian from Dublin, to speak on the clans, he says, can you trace them? Oh, I said the Duke of Argyll, I can trace them right back to the first seed, but don't ask me to trace the Cairdridge, the sub-clans. I cannot. And another word for Tinker in Scotland is the Cairdridge. Right, and we sometimes overuse the word unique, but I think in this site it is unique, and we should remember that. Mm -hmm. Are the committee agreeable then to that course of, of action? So as you've, you've heard, we're obviously very enthusiastic about um, your petition. <coughs> um, we'll keep you up to date with developments, um, and the, the clerks will let you know when uh, it's to be scheduled again, and you may be that you want to come to the gallery on that particular day, but we'll certainly <coughs> pursue that, and obviously we'll keep Mike Russell uh, up to date as well, because I know he's very interested in the petition. So thanks very much for coming along, and, and also thanks to all your colleagues for all the work they've done in this, I think, very, very interesting uh, petition. From the travelling people, thank you all. Not at all. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. I'll, I'll suspend for two minutes till our witnesses to change round. Uh, the second new petition is PE1526 uh, by Jack Fletcher on behalf of um, Sex Expression UK on making sex and relationship education in Scotland statutory for all schools. Members have a note by the clerk, the spice briefing on the petition. Uh, can I welcome the petitioner Jack Fletcher uh, and Rebecca Rice from uh, Sex Expression UK to the meeting. I can invite uh, Mr Fletcher to speak to the petitioner for around five minutes to set the context, <coughs> after which I'll kick off with some questions and then invite my colleagues to ask further questions. Mr Fletcher. Okay, good morning and thanks for having us. Um, so the petition I, asked, I sent in was for asking for compulsory sex and relationship education for primary and secondary schools. And I'd just like to draw attention that the petition did garner as much as 1,096 uh, signatures and also was supported by BMA Scotland, THT Scotland, HIV Scotland, Rape Crisis Scotland and also the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association who also agreed that what we're asking for is appropriate. Our concern is that many schools are actually not being teaching sex relationship education at all and they're missing out on very vital 
information that can tackle public health issues, such as the rate of sexual transmitted infections, teenage conception, domestic violence and sexual harassment. Improvements in RE have been backed by evidence and they can also address um, such issues as the lack of um, exposure or their exposure to pornography or an incidences of homophobia, biphobia and also transphobia. I strongly believe that this omission of crucial information together with a lack of incon inconsistency across the country is a breach of human rights in relation to education, health and child protection for children and young people of, of Scotland. I believe that a statutory change is necessary and that um, sex education is a fundamental human right and without it we are not equipping our children and young people with the knowledge to make safe, healthy and positive choices about their sexual and emotional health and well-being and it's a violation of these rights and should be a major child protection concern for the Scottish Government. Um, currently, the Scottish Government figures show that sex and relationship education is lacking across schools. In the petition, I'd already said how 13 out of 299 primary schools are not teaching it. But in, in high school, there's some areas in, in regions such as Strathclyde, where it's only 84% of um, schools teaching sex and relationship education. This just is clearly just not enough. As the British Medical Association wrote in a written statement to the Health and Sports Committee inquiry into teenage pregnancy in 2013, and that they, although part of a curriculum of excellence, they were not, sexual health um, promotion was not implemented uniformly across Scotland. Um, There is also very much a lack of training for teachers that are providing this education. There's as few as one to five people trained per area of and region of the country, and this is as low as 43% um, with across different regions. Um, so Scottish children and young people are left not only with a lack of information, but is being delivered by untrained teaching staff. This would not happen in other areas of education, and it is shocking that in such a case for, for a key area of personal, social and health education programme that is being omitted. This lack of consistency is further evidenced in other examples, with the BMA welcoming the Learning and Teaching Scotland self-assessment tool for this area of the curriculum as a useful source, but argued that its implication was Apache across the country. Again, in a written response to the Teenage Pregnancy Inquiry, NHS Fort Valley noted that Curriculum for Excellence was designed to facilitate better links with sex education to potential real-life situations, such as the impact of alcohol use of, on the use of sexual behaviours and risk-taking in young people. NHS Health Scotland itself was particularly critical of programmes in school. It argued that although evidence clearly justified comprehensive sex and relationship education in, in the education settings, there was no obligation to do more Quote, do more than the minimum, mostly around friendships, relationships, as de demonstrated in the Curriculum for Excellence. End quote. It is also argued, argued that there was no requirement to use evidence and form resources, with the result that inappropriate or out of date and sometimes inaccurate or misleading materials could be used in schools. It suggested that there were no requirement for teachers and other prov providing sex in relationship education to be to have undertaken any additional training. The overall effect, as NHS Scotland, Health Scotland concluded, was that sex relationships education was patchy and introduced at too late a developmental stage, with schools left to decide for themselves what and how they would deliver, and with very little feedback from pupils and to assess effectiveness. Um, I'm wary of the time. Um, so, to conclude on what I have and other evidence that I have with me today, um, the, the provision of sex and relationship education is very good in Scotland and the curriculum for excellence does have that um, leeway to it for making it more appropriate for certain regions, but just now there's certainly not all schools providing this education. It's patchy and it's also not of a great 
um, level as the teachers themselves are not actually be, um, trained in the area themselves. We're English teachers and are already. You may have concerns that the the curriculum for excellence does flexible and that it's not got any compulsory elements, but I would draw a point to that the religious and moral education is already compulsory part and we would be seeking the same sort of um, level of um, Okay. Commitment. <laughs> yeah, to his extra relationship okay, education. Yeah. Th thank, you. thank you very much uh, for your contribution and could also encourage uh, Rebecca Rice if she wishes to answer any questions just to catch um, I. It Maybe you've partly covered uh, my first question, but is there not already an obligation of local authorities under the 2001 circular to provide a broad framework of sexual health education in schools? Yeah, um, it's just from the a review of sexual, sex and relationship education in Scottish secondary schools by the Wellbeing and Sexual Health report did show that there was a very amount of 83 to as much as 93%, but it really should be 100% of kids reaching this level of information. <clears throat> so it's, it's patchy, and also local authorities are carrying out in different ways across Scotland. Is that yeah. partly your point? Basically, the, the current... <coughs> Um, way we're doing things just isn't working. It's not STI rates have not changed since 1994, and mm. things with like teenage pregnancies haven't gone down much at all. And this is something that we have tried to tackle, and we ha do have very good teaching in an education system. But mm. the fact that things aren't changing and that there's new pressures for children that, that things need to change, and the compulsory aspect is needed for all children to reach this information. Thank you. Um, my final question is, you may or may not be aware that this uh, committee did a major inquiry into child sexual exploitation. Um, what, what we got a request from Bernardo's to carry this work out. One of the recommendations was that we wish to raise awareness about CSE, both with teachers and, of course, with pupils, particularly around um, internet um, safety and sexual bullying, which does come, uh, I think, tie in quite closely with uh, you know, with your petition, would you agree that that was a very important step uh, in schools uh, in Scotland? Yeah, there's there's lots of areas. It um, seems to be a lot of things are just very biological and not much actual reference to the relationship sides or, as I say, key aspects that kids are facing of online dangers and the, the effect of pornography, whether they're watching it or not, um, is something that needs to be more updated. And clearly, you know, sexual grooming was an issue that we took a lot of evidence about. And so obviously schools have a very, very important role. In many ways, you know, teachers have obviously got massive responsibilities in the school. But they are, they are experts on the children they are charged, and they can notice huge changes of behaviour. Um, but I think it has to be done in a partnership way. That's what we were stressing in our, in our report. Thank you for that. Can I bring in my colleagues? Um, can I start with Anne McTaggart, then David Torrance. Thank you, convener, and welcome, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, coming from a social work background, um, I'm well aware of the importance of, of it being statutory in a sense. However, I am concerned of the young people that perhaps don't go to school as often as what they would uh, like to or, or be should do. Um, so that, that, there is a huge onus then on our youth work provision. Um, for to try and enable that, that that message does still get across to our young people, um, no matter what medium that takes. But also, with, with that, there is a huge part of it that has to be, over, has to be left to parents as well. Um, and that's about using some of the parental mediums, um, the Parent Scotland Network, and, you know, and for, for parents to perhaps learn more about how that they could be more involved in, in informing their children about SHRI as well. I, I'm well aware that within my children's schools, they're both primary and secondary, well up to date on, on SHRI. Um, but I, I take w what you say, that, 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 that there is slippage there throughout. Yeah, do you want to answer that one? So do you have a specific question or just want to sort of talk Really about the importance yeah. of youth work, the mm. youth provision? Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I think that youth work is a really great way of sort of 
getting people who've fallen through the net that way. So, like for example, sex expression does do some work with youth um, youth clubs. I think that's a really important point, and I think it, um, the parental point is also really key. I think um, school can't do everything. Like it's not up to school to do, especially in sense of relationships and things like that. So, I think extending guidelines out to youth clubs and getting parents more involved is really important. Um, but I think school should be a baseline. I think that that's where it's the best way to get to the majority of young people and children. So I think that school should be sort of leading the way forward. And if schools, um, by their own sort of volition, want to get involved with um, local youth clubs and invite parents to come, I think that should definitely be encouraged. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David Torrance. Um, good morning. You're talking about training and teachers and lack of training. Do you think um, NHS Scotland's got a greater role to play? And the reason I'm saying it is one of uh, my schools in my constituency, Kirkcaldy High School, took a very bold move to go into par partnership with NHS Fife um, to create a hub within the school. They made the headlines for giving out free condoms in the, the mail, but um, working with the pupils who are on it, the teachers and NHS Fife, They've made a huge success in an area of deprivation and seen a massive reduction in teenage pregnancies within that area. And my constituency has one of the highest rates. So do you think NHS Scotland has got a greater role in partnership working to go into schools and create these hubs? Do you mind if I take that one? So yeah. um, living and working in Fife, I thought might be best. We actually work with NHS Fife as well in um, Sex Expression St Andrews. So I absolutely agree. I think the work that NHS Fife particularly do with skills is excellent and should be encouraged. I think it's not always up to the teachers to deliver this. Having external organisations is always fantastic, not only because they're experts in the subject, but it can be helpful for the pupils. They can even really engage with the outside speaker just because it's not the usual person. They can feel more comfortable like just being relaxed, especially for peer educators. So that's something we find a lot. So yeah, I think um, NHS Fife do a lot of good work. I'm sure um, other counties do great work as well. <laughs> but yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I think that um, Part, I mean, part of the recommendation currently in place for the guidelines for SRE is to encourage the use of external speakers, which is how we get our gig in quite well. Yeah, absolutely. Jackson Carlo. Good morning. Uh, I'm slightly conflicted by your petition. I mean, I've spoken in public health in the Parliament for the last number of years, and I'm acutely aware of, of all the uh, difficulties there are, particularly amongst young people with the spread of sexual disease. Uh, chlamydia in particular, which, you know, Frankly, I suppose in a shorthand, you could say many boys think has nothing to do with them, uh, when of course it is everything to do with them. Um, and I respect and agree with a number of the objectives within your petition, but it strikes me that there's a difference between guidance, advice and information and the statutory incorporation into the curriculum where I would worry that there would be a perceived version of what is correct and that that perceived version of what is correct might in some ways be at odds with um, the parents for whom all these children are still dependents. And I wonder if there may not be a conflict that arises there through making it a statutory part of the curriculum. So that's one question for you to reflect on. And the other is, we talk about Scotland, um, and very often the indices that we um, look at uh, are in comparison to other countries. And I wonder whether we, you have looked at the way other countries are currently, um, particularly uh, those countries adjacent or immediate to us, um, both within the United Kingdom, but also within the European Union, looking to try and develop an understanding of these fields, admitting, of course, they come from a different starting point and with a different cultural perspective. But uh, that may be something which I would want some further understanding of before I would be sure how to take forward your petition. Um, I'll take the first question and then Rebecca can give you a case study that we had prepared actually from Finland. Um, in terms of parents, and sort of, there's always that concern apart from it, but there is always, there's lots of studies that do back that around 80% of teach, um, parents do completely back sex and ed education relationship information. It's about teaching factual information that are often just very health based in what it is and then they can actually make their own decisions based on that information. It's not about coercing them into some sort of that that everyone should get an abortion or things like that that some people do get a bit worried about, which is fine because you don't have to take you don't have to use the contraception if you don't want to, but it's getting the facts that that something as like a condom can prevent chlamydia and that they, they giving them the 
that tool to a knowledge to be able to apply that to their lives is what's really important. And parents can be involved in the um and how sex education is that's why I think if we had a core of certain values that were compulsory, then parents could also um discuss as part of their PTAs of, of like what sort of things could that be then be more appropriate. So it's sort of things like gender based violence, maybe that might not be in a core but it could be sort of more applicable to certain regions. Yes, but it, my concern I think is when it becomes part of the statutory mm -hmm. curriculum there is a received wisdom as to what is correct. Uh, and I have already seen with my own son's education in a completely alternate example where they were talking about the political systems. And my son argued that he thought first past the post was the correct political system. And he was marked down because that was incorrect. He was told the ideal political system was a proportional one. Now, that struck me as a perception of somebody else's truth being on, posed on him. Now, I extend that to uh, sexual education and sexual attitudes. And I would worry that there was a received wisdom as to what was correct. And that anyone who perhaps took an alternative view to that <coughs> would be told that they were wrong. Uh, when in fact that's a subjective argument, not necessarily an absolute one. Of course, and the, the well, the, the this current guidelines that instead of making them statutory are already very robust and evidence-based and careful thought to such issues as you've raised. And it's, it, the difference is just them making it compulsory, whereas the what what is appropriate has already been found by the education part of the government. That was a, um, I'll just get yeah, sorry, I just jump in there? Um, I absolutely agree with you. I think that is a really common concern. And what we would be looking for um, to be implemented would be sort of two separate parts. It would be the fact confirmation, which there isn't really much discussion around the, the facts about. This is the STI rates. These are different efficacy rates of contraception and so on. Then there's more discussion-based things. I do not think that teachers should be told to preach any sort of ideology at all. It should be more about facilitating discussion and really looking for discussion. It's, it's, I think it's good for children to hear all sides of an argument. I think that will really inform their learning. So, for example, with gender-based violence, I do think that should be compulsory at all. I don't think that should be optional. I think that discussions about domestic violence, rape, assault, and child abuse should definitely be brought up in schools and from a young age. And like, There are core values that I think that we should be promoting, certainly, but never, ever an ideology. So, for example, <coughs> abortion is always the one that's the big, you know, controversy and I think that it can be definitely taught appropriately I think you put the information out there and you ask you give them scenarios so you say like is it appropriate xyz what would a religious um, view be on, on that be and you facilitate discussion it's never about preaching so it'd be more about asking teachers to facilitate discussions on those topics and it wouldn't be like an exam you would never get like two marks for mentioning a certain study and it'd be more about it wouldn't be like an exam, say, for biology, but more like with RE, where you have a discussion. I think that's a really important point. Okay, thank you, convener. Thank you for that. Uh, John Wilson. Thank you, convener. <coughs> and maybe Jackson, Carlo, and myself can have a discussion about democracy at a later date <laughs> in relation to what's the best perceived electoral system. But in relation to the uh, petition before us, uh, mm -hmm. clearly some of the figures that you've used, where you've said one quarter, 24%, had no SRE uh, trained staff, and in 52% of schools, the staff currently responsible for SRE delivery were not trained. Do you think there is insufficient uh, training <coughs> being provided to teaching staff when they're being asked to take on this, what could <coughs> potentially be seen as a vital role in awareness raising for many young people in society today? I would say yes. Um, I'd give the example of my own mum, who's an English teacher at high school, and I was at, she said she does sex and relationship education. I was like, so have you ever been taught in sort of the health and what is chlamydia and things like that, and what is the, a healthy relationship? And she was just like, no, you just kind of go on what you think is, is about right. And with the guidelines, there is that sort of assurance that you can fall back on something, but there is definitely a lot of teachers out there really struggling with the lack of training that they have and for there to be great PSHE teachers within this, the system, of course. And I've met many, and some of the sex ed is great in Aberdeen where, where I've been um, meeting in schools.
but there's there's just so many teachers that aren't trained. And the, the, the quote I had was one to five people in the region. I mean, think how many schools are per region, so that might be only one teacher per school that's trained in it. So are all the t all the children being um, being able to be taught by the one teacher? It's just not feasible. So the lack of training it really is becoming a, an issue. My colleague David Torrance made reference to the work that's been done in Fife with the NHS in Fife. Do you think that is a more practical way forward for local authority education departments to work in conjunction with others uh, in terms of the delivery of SRE in the schools? Uh, because one of the things is that while we may have a lack of trained teachers at the present moment, certainly we've got uh, health education staff within the NHS that I'm sure could be utilised within the school, school system, uh, not only providing some awareness raising in the schools, but also potentially continued backup care uh, for those pupils that identify particular issues, uh, such as uh, STDs or whatever in relation to their lifestyles uh, or their, their peer group lifestyle. We've got um, statistics here that, in, in from the, the Wellbeing and Sexual Health report, that uh, there is 76% of regions using um, other professionals that can give the sort of in-depth knowledge, and and that's a great thing. I mean, with our our sex expression, I mean, we wouldn't be in the schools without the consent of the school, and. But the, the fact is that even though we are getting external organisations and we are getting involvement of NHS, which is the five one was I thought was fantastic, um, just the, the fact is that it's just not working. There's been no change in STI rates. There's not. There's been all these issues that are not being tackled, and that's the issue that I'm raising today. Basically, is that we we need to do something more than we are just now. Finally, convener, just a question that you have raised in your submission, the issue about denominational education and uh, a part <laughs> lack of uh, the teaching of sexual health awareness within uh, some schools. <coughs> uh, do you think in this day and age that that is, should be allowed to continue or do you think every child attending school should have their awareness raised in relation to uh, relationships. Yeah, that was one of the main points I, I wanted to get in my statement was that I feel like with schools not providing this SRE, they're just it's a lack, it's a breach of the human rights of the children that they're not reaching this education status that Scotland of all places should be doing. And that we, we talked about other countries um, where there was, uh, where was it? Um, you asked about um, it was Jackson Carla and one from Finland, and because they have sex education already, and they had a, f a fifty percent, um, sorry, uh, basically <laughs> Finland did much. Uh, can you you can do that bit, isn't it? You know it better. But yeah, <laughs> sorry that was her bit to speak. Um, but basically, Finland have definitely got. There's always there's a Switzerland, Holland. Um, Sweden, Germany, Spain, they all have such to sex education and we're actually very much far behind this standard human right that our children aren't being exposed to. Do you want to The Finland case study? Yeah. yeah, sorry. We did have a much longer speech at the beginning than because we, we thought we had more time, so that's why we're a bit over the place. Um, so in Finland, the <coughs> sex education was compulsory in schools in 1970 and then that was um, dropped down to optional in 1994 and at that point, there was a 50% increase in teenage abortions. There was an increase in girls starting to have sex at younger ages, so 14, 15, and there was a decline in the use of contraception. And then um, in 2006, a new subject, health, was introduced, and it was made compulsory, with some classes having a minimum of 20 hours training in it. And at that point, the trend just immediately started to reverse, and girls are now starting to have sex at an older age. They're using more contraception. Teenage abortions has dropped, and um, there's a small decline in teenage births. So... I think it really is a massive public health tool, education, certainly. Thank you for that. Jim Eady. Uh, thank you, Peter, and good morning. Uh, can I just ask you what involvement and input you've had in the development of the new draft guidance that's been taken forward by the Scottish Government and the associated um, learning materials that would be provided uh, alongside that? Well, um, 
it was a little bit late actually in in getting involved with it, particularly in Scotland, because um, there was a letter sent from I think it was the Human Rights Association for in a centre in Glasgow, um, and they'd already sent off the letter that we would have backed publicly. So basically, nothing. <laughs> so do you have a view on the the guidance as it currently stands? Basically, that is it's very good. It, it, there's a lot of um, when followed, it is definitely going to help towards these sort of public health issues. And just what's missing is that there's basically is that there's some schools that aren't getting this information. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, sorry, um, but the guidance is fantastic. It's the only issue that it's not being implemented fully. I think that if it was made compulsory, then I think that'd be fantastic. The guidance is really good. Have you seen your submission um, you, that there are a number of reasons why making um, Sex and relationship education in Scotland statutory is a, is both necessary and a priority, and one of those is the issue of homophobia in schools, which you highlight as being something that leads to self harm, depression, and reduced educational attainment for young people. Can you outline for the committee um, how you see that issue being tackled uh, more effectively as a result of the change that you're proposing? Well, there's definite. Um, studies that show that sex and relationship education does um, make the LGBT um, I, um, community much more included as schools don't, they take away that stigma and take away that sort of um, homophobic angle with through that, that is through lack of understanding of the issues that is going on and as I say that a lot of schools are very good they are sort of the gay friendly sort of um, systems that they've gotten but it's just that there's not enough schools that are doing this basically i think there's there's again it's, it's sort of there's two ways of doing it there's the factual base which i think um lgbt is not done enough i think that um a lot of homophobia stems from just misunderstanding i think particularly with trans it can be just issues like just not understanding what it means so there's i think there's that one aspect of just like <coughs> clarifying terminology for children letting them know that Think just simple things like that HIV is not a gay disease. It's it's really surprising how many people still think that and still associate with the, with only the, um, the LGBT community, particularly um, with gay men. Then there's the more, again, more discussion based. So um, lesson plans that we do around homophobia can be things like setting up scenarios where you imagine yourself bringing your partner to dinner or things like that. And then can you now imagine if um, or you always clarified first, imagine bringing an opposite sex um, partner. Um, now imagine if your partner um, was the same sex, what kind of issues is that going to cause for you? And to highlight just the everyday problems that um, the LGBT community do face, things like that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we're a bit short of time. Does any other member have any final questions before we go to summation? Uh, well, thank you very much for um, your, your petition. We're now at the point where we're, we're finished with questions. We're looking at the next steps. It certainly seems sensible that we right to the Scottish Government to seek their views on your petition, because obviously it's clearly a Scottish Government um, responsibility. You've also mentioned the new guidance on sex and relationship education. Well, I think we need to clarify um, um, when the final version will be complete, um, and we'll then you know, keep you up to date with developments. But that's my suggestion. I'd like to hear the, from the committee. First of all, are the committee uh, agreeable that that's a, a next step for us in terms of pursuing this petition? John Wilson? You know, I know you've said right to the Scottish Government. Uh, can I just seek clarification? Because I, I think we should be right to the Scottish Government Education uh, Department, but we should also be right to the Health Department as well. Mm -hmm. Because I think there are two separate issues here in relation to the guidance issued to, and to the education departments around mm -hmm. Scotland, local authorities. Uh, because I think that it, the overlap that takes place and has to take place if we're going to be committed to delivering meaningful uh, sex and relationship education uh, to pupils in schools. The other organisations coming in, I would suggest we write to, are the EIS, because we're at, we talked about teaching staff in the schools. Uh, one issue that was raised uh, by Mr Fletcher was the issue about the lack of training provided to those mm. teachers who are expected to go into a classroom and deliver <coughs> uh, SRE. I could also suggest we write to either COSLA or a couple of the local authorities uh, to find out exactly how they are using the guidance, because clearly guidance is only guidance, uh, and it's basically left up to the 32 local authority 
uh, to actually determine how that guidance can be used. And I think by Ms Rice and Mr Fletcher clearly indicated the guidance is really good, but it's only really good if it's being applied and used within the education setting. And we have to try and ensure that when we write to the Scottish Government, we try and impress upon them that we should be expecting that guidance to be delivered in the, the educational settings uh, that children find themselves in. Uh, because clearly, without you know, anything, they can, you know, as I said, guidance can be really excellent. But unless it's actually been taught uh, and delivered, then clearly it's no, of no benefit. Uh, particularly to many young people that, that require that support and assistance and guidance in terms of their future. Thank you for that. Uh, Jackson Carlow. Uh, convener, can I suggest we write to the consulates based in Edinburgh of some of our European partners? I think it would be interesting if uh, a number of them were able to give us a concise briefing on these, how these issues are addressed in their own countries and what the outcomes of that practice have been. That's a interesting point. Are members agreeable with the two additional points made by Jackson Carlow and John Wilson, in addition to the points that I made? Um, uh, thank you for that. So, as you've heard, we're obviously taking your petition forward. We'll, once we've got the responses back, it will be scheduled uh, by the clerk in a future date. Um, obviously, uh, if you wish to attend in, in the gallery, you're welcome to do so. So, we'll keep you up to date with developments and um, Hopefully we'll get some progress on, I think, very important points that you've raised in your presentation today. And I can thank both of you for coming along and uh, putting forward uh, the points in your petition in a very professional manner. Thank you both. And I'll suspend for two minutes to allow our witnesses to change round. Thank you. Start our committee. Um, we're now on PE 1529 by John Ronald on enforcement of child court orders. Uh, the, third, uh, the third and fourth new petitions are in the name of John Ronald. The committee agreed to invite Mr Ronald to speak to the petition on the enforcement of child court orders, but not on the petition about uh, child court reform. Members have a note by the clerk, the spice briefing of the petition. Can I welcome the petitioner? You're very welcome. Thanks for coming along. And can I invite you, if you could speak to a maximum of five minutes on the petition, and thereafter, we will kick off with some questions from myself and my colleagues. Certainly. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Mr. Convener, and the rest of the committee for inviting me along to give evidence uh, on my petition. Um, this petition is a very close-hearted petition to myself, um, and I'm not a very good public speaker, so I do apologise if I get mixed up or hesitating or anything like that. Um, First of all, I would like to start by saying 
when family breakups happen, it's dramatic, and uh, not in particular for the children. You know, they go through a whole load of emotions. Um, generally, nine out of ten times, it's the mother who ends up with the, the child in custody, and the father has to go through court if there's not an agreement between them uh, on visitation. The non-resident parent follows what the rules are set out by the government and the law and goes through a whole road, a whole wide range of uh, court sessions and hiring a lawyer, paying a lot of money for a lawyer to go to get visitation rights for their children. The once visitation contact has been granted by the judge um, as the judge deems what is in the best interest of the child. There's been an increasing um, there's been an increasing episodes of where the resident, the parent with residence, um, just changes the contact order, changes the times to suit herself. You know, uh, this was highlighted in the Herald on May of this year that there was a, a very large increase in the resident, the parent with residency. Uh, just chops and changes the order as and when they suit. Now, there is no enforcement of this order apart from having to go back to court again, uh, which again costs the, the non resident parent thousands of pounds, you know, and, and it's generally 80% of them are hard working, working class people, especially in this climate where there's been pay freezes, the, the wage isn't going up the same way as inflation. Um, so the, res the, the, the parent with non-residency has to, has to pay thousands of pounds to hire a lawyer again, to go back to court for the judge to mostly be quite dismissive um, in these matters. I've had personal um, experience with this, where um, the parent who has just totally disobeyed an order has just turned around, the judge has turned around and said to them, no, don't do that again, uh, follow the order that's been made, and there's been no sanctions, there's been nothing put in place. You know, the police can't do anything to help. Um, the only people who actually gain from uh, the order not being followed is the lawyers, uh, because they end up getting paid thousands of pounds more, which Working class people go into a lot of debt for. It's not an option not to do it. You know, you've got two options. It's either one, you just don't see your child, or you let the, the mother of your child, or the father of the child, whoever's got custody of the children, do as they wish, uh, which isn't an option for most parents. Most parents would gladly go into debt uh, just to try and get it resolved. I'm simply here to ask yourselves and the government, you know, it's, is, is there not um, a body, a governing body which can enforce child orders? Now, I would understand if there was a problem if the father or the mother who doesn't have custody uh, was putting the child at risk or if there was issues, I would, I would completely agree with not giving uh, the child over. I wouldn't give my child back if I thought my child was at risk. But if it's just the fact that the non-resident parent, uh, the parent with residence, just wants to change things because it suits their lifestyle, because it suits what they're doing for that week or for that month, um, you know, I do believe that there should be something in place that actually stops that from happening instead of punishing the, the person who's followed the rules and regulations that were set out by the government on how to obtain access through the legal system. Uh, went through the whole legal uh, aspect, got a court order, and just for that court order to be dismissive. Even lawyers, uh, I must admit, some lawyers even dismiss uh, the court order. I actually have with me um, a letter which I got from a lawyer um, telling me that uh, there was no discussion or anything uh, around access to my child and I've got a letter from a lawyer uh, just telling me that uh, access won't take place, you know, and that's that. 
we are, there's been no discussion about a holiday or anything. They've just sent my letter out saying access isn't going to happen for this period of time. And there's, there's really no one that can do anything about it apart from me having to go back into debt, which I have done, to go back through court to spend thousands of pounds that I don't have. Uh, but, as I said, it's not an option. Uh, there's no... I can't just sit back and then you know, not see my child. Uh, so I would rather go into debt, which I can't afford. Like most fathers, have, which have been proven in the Herald, which they've done in May, most fathers and mothers who, know that, who don't have access would gladly go into as much debt as they can to get it resolved. And really that's the basis of my petition, is that you know, there should be something there where we can go to uh, if there's no risk and it's just a, uh, uh, it's just the fact that the, the mother or the father, whoever has residence, uh, changed their mind because they happen to want to go away for that week or they happen to have a night out that week so you're not seeing the child for that day. You know, there should be something in place that says this is the court order and unless there's significant risk to the child, any dangers or any, th any fears, then you must follow up. Um, thank you. Th thank you very much for your presentation. I know um, there was some quite difficult personal uh, issues ar around your presentation, uh, so I appreciate you coming along and speaking about the Scotland-wide issue. So clearly you feel there's a weakness in the current court procedure as far as uh, child access procedures are concerned. How would you remedy in an ideal world that, that weakness that you perceive in the Scottish court system? I would set up either... Um, I would either set up a family kind of liaison uh, body, you know, where they're kind of similar to the police, but they're not the police, but they do have powers where if contact doesn't happen, they would come out uh, on that day. Like you would, if, if your house was buggled, uh, you would phone the police, the police would come out that day. You would phone some somebody who uh, has legal powers to come out, ascertain what's going on, um, and then determine whether there's you know, significant facts to why or why the court order isn't being followed. And if the court order isn't being followed, then I do believe there should be sanctions, um, whether it be that the other partner has to pay the legal fees or whether it be you know, the other partner is given warnings or, I don't know, sanctions of some sort, but there should be a legal body uh, to make sure that court orders do follow so that people who do um, go through the legal channels, which is set out by the government, you know, they tell us this is what you must do to get access. We go through all those channels, we spend all that money. Uh, so, you know, we feel let down. We feel there should be something there to support us. Once we've done that, once access has been granted, we feel let down that there's the police or no one else, a social worker that can get involved and you have to go back to the start again and go all the way through the court process, which can take months. And the only people who get hurt through that is the, the parent who doesn't see the child and the child himself. Well, you may be aware we also have another petition which we're looking at was Ron Park about equal rights for unmarried fathers. So it may be, if the committee is agreeable, that we try and consolidate all the discussions we're doing about the same issue um, at a later date. But that's obviously a matter for the committee. Um, it may not exactly cover your point, um, Mr. Ronald, but the last session, the Justice Committee uh, did look at and suggested that there be a Scotland-wide system of specialist family law courts which it hasn't come to fruition, but certainly they made some recommendations uh, in an area which is not too far away from you know, some of your suggestions. So there has been some uh, debate around this. And I think one of, the other acts, one of the other issues we've had in previous petitions is about access to legal aid, which is um, obviously a, a difficult issue, and you yourself have identified that. Um, could I then bring in my colleagues to see if there's any other questions or points? Any colleague wish to ask a point? Um, I'm McTaggart. Yep, thank you, convener, and thank you very much, Mr Ronald, for your presentation. Um, I'm finding it more and more within my own surgery cases that um, it's, it's kind of turning that um, there has been loads of fathers had, had pre presented at my surgery um, for access to their children and obviously they have grievances with the, the legal system 
in place just now. However, um, I am a huge supporter of mediation and think that your idea is great. You know that, that we should. The only person that does gain from is exactly you're correct is the legal system, the lawyers um, who gain financially from this, and obviously the losers are the children. Um, I think it's hugely important that we do, as what the convener has asked, we do have a few of these petitions that could be put together. And for the committee, I would be suggesting that we do look at them together and perhaps look into, inquire into the, the justice system's report that they have done um, previously. I fully agree with, with what you had suggested. I think that's a fabulous idea, but obviously it's not entirely up to myself um, for that to happen. Um, I think something's got to happen. I think something's got to happen. Um, and I think for to continue this um, petition and enable us to inquire further, convener, yeah. would be a great idea. Thank you. Fat, uh, John Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Mr. Ronald. <coughs> in your submission, uh, you indicated that you spoke to Scottish Government child legal team, uh, who indicated they can't enforce the order uh, on the basis of the, in the best interest of the child. Can you expand on the discussion that took place? Uh, because my understanding is that we put legislation in place to allow the courts to make decisions, particularly around access. Uh, and what you're telling us today is that a court grants access rights to a parent, uh, but those access rights can then just be ignored uh, by the parent who has residency or by any other individual who purports to be putting the interest of the child first. Yes. I mean, I do actually have written proof um, of a court order and a lawyer's letter uh, which the lawyer's letter totally contradicts the court order. Um, as far as the, the point you were making about the discussion I had with the legal team, they said um, that they can't enforce any sort of legal action, as in having the police get involved or any other organisation, because it would have to go back through the courts to see why contact isn't taking place. Um, and. I explained to them, going back through the courts is going to cost thousands of pounds. The convener mentioned legal aid. I'm a nurse. Uh, I don't qualify for legal aid, you know, but I'm one of those people who are just above the legal aid aspect, but are also hit by not just a five-year pay freeze, but you know, my wage barely gets me passed. Uh, so I don't have help, uh, but like most fathers in my situation, um, and there will be some mothers out there as well. Uh, when you phone up the Scottish Government, when you speak to the legal department, you're just told they have to go back to court because the court has to then decide what is in the best interest. When they already have decided what's in the best interest, I was just totally fobbed off. That, that's the point I'm trying to get to, Mr Ronald. If you've went to court to get get granted access rights, the people supposed to deliver that access right then ignores the court order, then what ultimately is happening is, and I think uh, Anne McTaggart and others have, and yourself have mentioned, the only people that seem to be making uh, any real benefit out of this are the legal profession and the courts potentially are being clogged up and reviewing decisions that have already been made by the courts. And I can understand if there is a major change to circumstances, that then there may be issues about granting continued access. But clearly, uh, as a convener, I think it's an issue that, like Anne McTaggart, I think we need yeah. to take forward and yeah. ask the Scottish Government for clarification and what the intention of the legislation is mm. if it's not delivering for... Uh, parents who want access rights and have been granted access rights? I mean, certainly the brief would suggest that um, I obviously don't want to talk about your individual case, and if you don't mind, perhaps don't mention here because it gets us into legal difficulties. But the, the generality would be if uh, one parent had access arrangements through the court and the other parent refused to allow that to happen, 
that would be a that would be a um, contempt of court. And uh, if it was required to have legal a action on the other side of the case, that the costs could also be granted as well. So there is some solutions there. Um, I think it's useful for us to do a bit more, you know, digging into this particular points that you're raising. Would other members wish to raise um, any general points that's been discussed this afternoon? So, I mean, I suppose what I would summarise from, I mean, the philosophy is, I think, is well known to us all, but clearly um, the current philosophy, which I think successive governments have looked at in, 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 um, around uh, children, has been that it, we should have a child-centred approach rather than a parent-centred approach, that the welfare of the child would be paramount, and that also that the, the views and wishes of a child, bearing in mind the age and maturity of the child, has to be taken on board. And obviously the family law, uh, Scotland 2006, said that uh, the need to protect a child from actual or possible abuse, which you yourself mentioned as well, is another factor that courts <coughs> need to take into account. I think it's important to mention that. It's probably well known by yourself and the committee. It's just that that should be and will be the philosophy that's in the mind of, of, of a judge when these cases come before uh, the judge in day-to-day uh, -day cases. But it may be, as Justice Committee suggested last time around, that there is a better model and certainly the issue of access to uh, legal advice is a big issue uh, that you've rightly identified, and other petitioners have done that as well. So does any other committee member wish to raise any other, other points? Um, now, I flagged up that we already have had a very similar petition by Ron Park, um, and Mr Ron's got a further petition thereafter, which he's not speaking on in child court reform. It may be that the committee wish to consolidate these in the future. However, I do think there are some issues here that we need to try and get some information back from, from obviously Scottish Government, the Law Society, Family Law Association, Family Need Father Scotland, about their views on the petition so we can start doing some work on this. But clearly the management of the petition is up to the committee as a whole. But I would seek first of all the committee's views whether you wish to follow that course of events or alternatively we could defer complete consideration of this until uh, the 11th of November when we are looking at Mr Park's uh, petition again. So that's the two main courses of action I would suggest you do in terms of how you manage this individual petition. Could I get first of all views from the committee on which course of action they wish to follow? The, uh, it's the first, we do some work now, or the second we defer everything until Mr Park's petition comes up. John Wilson. Commissioner, I think we should do some work on this at the present time. I think we need to, uh, as you've suggested, write to the Scottish Government uh, to seek clarification on what the legislation is intended to deliver. Uh, the Law Society of Scotland's views would be useful, uh, Family Law Association, uh, Families Need Father yeah. Scotland. I uh, could also suggest we actually write to Women's Aid as well, because I yeah. think Women's Aid have commented in the past about access rights. Uh, and equally, I think it might be useful to write to the Children's Commissioner yeah. uh, to yeah. seek the views, of, because we are talking about in the best interest of the child. Uh, and really, while this may be a dispute between parents about access, we need to bear in mind we have to put the child first in any decisions that are being made. So it may be useful to get a, a comment from the Children's Commissioner on this issue. I think particularly, I think perhaps Mr Park raised this at, uh, in his petition, is that I think there was some suggestion that if a parent can't get legal aid and therefore can't get legal representation, is that a breach of European Convention Human Rights? So it might be worth getting some view on that. Ah, McTaggart? I fully agree with um, my colleague John Wilson about trying to do some work on this just now, but also including, um, I agree with what's been mentioned so far, but also including, I'm not sure if we've mentioned uh, social work, Scottish Council for Social Work, um, yes. for to ask their advice as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, David Torrance. Thank you for that. Thanks, MacDonald. Yeah, um, there's no harm, I don't think, in seeking clarification from the Scottish Government just now. Um, however, um, and, and uh, also contacting the other bodies already suggested, but uh, while we await further um, a consideration of, of the other petitions later on. Thank you for that, Jackson Carlow. Content. Um, Jim Eady. Nothing to add. Thank you very much for that. Well, uh, as you've heard, we're going to pursue your um, petition and we'll keep you obviously up to date, um, Mr Arnold, with, all, with, with developments. Um, obviously, in uh, future, if it is scheduled, you're welcome to be in the gallery and, and hear the proceedings. If, but obviously, I know that you'll probably have to take time off work, which is probably an expensive way of, of doing things. But obviously, we'll keep you up to date with, with the developments. Um, and thank you very much for 
coming along and giving your presentation on. I know it was very painful. It was obviously your personal experience in the court, uh, but thank you very much for that. I know you've got a petition after that, and um, if you wish to stay in the gallery, you're very, very welcome to do so. Um, but if you have to leave, we totally understand that. And I'll suspend for one minute to allow Mr. Uh, Ronald to leave his position. I've got a missed the, the rush hour traffic to get right. back to Glasgow. Um, can I just say thank you to yeah. everyone for right. allowing me this? Thank you very much. Appreciate thank you coming along. the committee. We're on the fourth and final new petition. is PE 1528, again by Mr John Ronald, on child court reform. Members of a note by the clerk, spice briefing uh, and the petition. Um, the, uh, the committee may wish to consider the petition, spice briefing and agree what action to take. I mean, the possible actions, again, are we may, uh, as I said at the previous uh, petition, when we agree to consider the petition alongside PE 1513, and that's scheduled on the 11th of November. Uh, in doing so, the committee might wish to encourage any organisation and individuals who wish to comment on the matter specifically raised in the petition to write to the committee prior to the meeting. Uh, alternatively, the committee may wish to consider that the issues raised in the petition are distinct from those raised by 1513 and they should be considered separately. So again, could just ask guidance from the committee on which course of action I wish to follow. John Mills. Content to hold off, convener, if that's the wishes of the rest of the committee. Okay. Are other committee members uh, um, also content that we hold off until we can consider them separately? So that would be when 1513 is up uh, again in, in November. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. If I move then to agenda item three, um, that's uh, consideration of current petitions. Um, there are nine on today's agenda. The first is PE 1319 by William Smith and Scott Robertson, Improving Youth Football in Scotland. I, I think members will agree this has been a, a very, very thorough uh, and first-class uh, petition. We, um, we, ha we agreed that we would um, ask the Children's Commissioner to do some work um, on this area. There's a scoping paper in front of you. Uh, I met the Commissioner and I'm, I'm very impressed with the planned work that's going to be carried out there. Um, if the committee are agreeable, the Youth uh, Young People's Commissioner will go away, do this work, and we'll report back at a future meeting. Is that agreed? agreed. Thank you for that. Um, the next petition is PE 1460 by Susan Archibald on behalf of the Scottish Parliament to Cross Party Group on Chronic Pain on Improvement of Services and Resources to Tackle Chronic Pain. Members have a note by the, uh, by the clerk. Um, again, I think this is a, a very, very good petition. We did a lot of work on this one. Uh, my view now is that we should close the petition under Rule 15.7 on the basis that the location and details of the new National Service for Chronic Pain have now been confirmed. Is that agreeable? Thank you very much. Um, the uh, next petition is PE 1482 by John Wormersley on isolation in single room hospitals. Members have a note by the clerk and submissions. Um, I know Alec Ferguson, MSP, had a strong constituency interest, but he wasn't sure whether he could attend today. Um, can in invite um, contributions from members, but I would certainly recommend that one possible <coughs> option is to consider the petition again once the Scottish Government's review of research and single bed accommodation hospitals is complete. Is that agreeable? Um, the next petition is PE 1497 by Ellie Harrison on behalf of Say No to Tesco on supermarket expansion on local high streets. Members have a note by the, the clerk. Um, I know that uh, Patrick Harvey, MSP, has a strong constituency interest, but, um, but he wasn't sure whether we can manage today. And also Sandra White similarly has a, an interest in this issue. Um, she's currently, I think, on Justice Committee and perhaps put her apologies um, for her inability to attend. Um, I mean, I would see it really, we have two real choices today. I think we can either close the petition on the basis that has been, we've explored the issue as far as we can within the policy areas devolved to the Scottish Parliament, or the other option is that we ask the Local Government and Regeneration Committee to consider the petition as it is seeking um, in the context of its scrutiny of the Community and Parliament Scotland Bill. Um, I think my preference personally would be for, for the latter, that we refer this to local government and regeneration and that they're doing some work. Uh, Angus MacDonald? Yes, yeah, um, I'd certainly be loath to uh, close the petition as it does have some, uh, some merit, um, particularly when you uh, look at the, the claims that major retailers are uh, regarded as running roughshod over independent retailers in, some, uh, in certain areas. Um, so I'd certainly uh, prefer to see the petition 
uh, referred to the Local Government and Regeneration Committee uh, to allow them to uh, to allow them to incorporate the, the petition and the work that they're currently doing for the Community Info Empowerment Bill. Thank you for that. Um, um, Patrick Harvey's just arrived. I know, um, Patrick Harvey, you've got a strong constituency uh, interest in this particular petition. Do you want to address the committee on um, your support uh, for the petition? Thank you very much, Convener. Can I apologise for just making it here by the skin of my teeth, uh, slightly out of breath. Uh, I'm aware that this isn't a full evidence session on this particular uh, petition, so can I thank you for the opportunity to speak briefly, simply to put on record once again the strong interest that I'm sure members will be aware of right throughout the country, but including in my own uh, region in Glasgow about this, this matter. Even in the, the few months since the committee last considered this petition, I'm aware of uh, even more small independent businesses, businesses with their roots in the local community that they serve, who've gone out of business in areas where supermarket expansion is continuing. Uh, this flies in the face even of the stated intentions of encouraging retail diversity uh, and vibrant, diverse high streets uh, and shopping areas. Uh, I think this, this is the, the one issue that I would encourage the uh, committee to take seriously, the conflict that exists between the, the stated objective of treating all applicants equally uh, and the, the objective of encouraging retail diversity in the same way as uh, equality policy that treats everybody equally does not achieve genuine equality for people. Uh, people have different needs. The same approach, I think, should be taken here. Treating all applicants equally, regardless of the identity of the applicants, regardless of the nature of the retail offer that's, that's going to change, and regardless of the, what we know very clearly about the economic impact of supermarket expansion, will not achieve the stated planning objectives of encouraging retail diversity, and I do encourage the committee once more to look as creatively and open-mindedly as possible at that case. Yeah, you, you probably just, you would have missed my comments in terms of options. I mean, basically, we boiled it down to two. One was that um, we closed the petition on the basis that we've explored the issue as far as we can, but the other one, which might be more appealing to you, is that we uh, refer the petition to Local Government Regeneration Committee because it's doing work on the scrutiny of the Community Empowerment Bill. Do you have any particular views, Mr. Harvey, on these options? If, if those are the only two options, then you perhaps won't be surprised uh, to learn that I would encourage you to uh, refer the, the petition on. Uh, the, the, the ongoing mismatch between stated objectives and what is happening in the ground, not just in Glasgow but around the country, is one that I do think requires further consideration. Thank you very much for your, um, your comments. Um, bring in uh, Jackson Carlow. I'm not a complete curmudgeon. I'm happy to support the latter of the two options. But I would just in so doing say that I'm doing so for two reasons. One is that I was aware that the petitioners felt very strongly we hadn't done justice to the considerable volume of work that they had produced, not all of which, as you know from my previous contributions, I'm entirely sympathetic to supporting the conclusion they would wish. But I would just also add, it, to give balance, of course, to Mr Harvey's intervention there, that I too, in the time since the last committee have met, am aware of areas and towns in Scotland where the opening of a local convenience store in what was otherwise a high street that was derelict has led to the prospering of additional new businesses adjacent to it. And therefore, I think we have to be very, very careful that we don't mount some unsubstantiated crusade against local convenience stores that are being operated by multiple nationals simply for that fact alone. For that, and I would never accuse you of being commanding this in any such way. Um, can I ask other members for their views on, we've certainly had two members, including, are we happy that we refer this to the Local Government and Regeneration Committee? <laughs> and uh, could, John Wilson. Convener, uh, as a member of the Local Government and Regeneration <laughs> Committee... I think you need uh, to declare an interest uh, for uh, Wilson. Yeah, extra so, work yeah, uh, no, it's not extra work, Convener. What, what I want to be <coughs> is convinced that the bill that's currently going through, Community Empowerment Bill, would be sufficient to deal with the issue the petitioner has raised. Uh, because the thing is that what we've been told by submission after submission is that planning cannot deal with this issue alone. Mm -hmm. And it's whether or not the Community Empowerment Bill uh, and the section that's the raised in terms of our notes today, 
would be sufficient to allay the fears of the petitioner and other communities around Scotland. Uh, and it's really, and, and the other issue for me would be, uh, is how the government themselves would view any additional powers or any issues within the community empowerment bill as it is presently presented could be amended to take account of the concerns that are raised in the original petition. Mm -hmm. uh, the other issue for me, convener, is I, I'm not sure whether the Ellie Harrison, the original petitioner, has responded to any of the, the issues raised by the responses we've received as a committee, uh, because it would be useful, uh, or, or would have been useful, to have uh, had a written submission from the petitioner just to indicate uh, what the views were to date in terms of the responses and how uh, they would perceive they would take the issue forward. But as I said, I, 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 I would have, and I think the original uh, the request was to look at the planning legislation and to find out how local authorities and their planning powers could actually tackle the issue of the the footprint being made by some of the major retailers in our town centres uh, and whether or not there is sufficient, as the Community Empowerment Bill currently stands, to allow uh, local authorities and others to reasonably raise objections or concerns about a major multinational uh, site themselves in the corner of the high street or in the centre of the high street. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, first of all, the petitioner hasn't responded, um, and I agree with you it would have been useful to have had that information. I think the complexity around this um, petition is that some elements of it um, are reserved to competition policy, and that has made it quite difficult. I do accept the points you're making um, around planning. Um, I'm actually quite encouraged by the community empowerment uh, bill. I think there's some sensible mm -hmm. ideas in, in that particular bill, but, but you're probably right to say that it's not going to be a magic wand for this particular petition. I just felt that because local government and regeneration were examining this, that might be a good opportunity for them to do a bit more work. And I do take Jackson Carlos' point. I know the petitioner has done a lot of work in evidence, and I wanted to make sure that that evidence was before another committee that had the ability to look at the, uh, look at it again with fresh eyes. I can only say, convener to the committee, that if that's the wishes of the committee to pass it on to the Local Government and Regeneration Committee for further consideration, I can tell the committee the timetable for examination of the Community Empowerment Bill uh, is very heavy uh, and to add a reasonable consideration of this petition in amongst what we're already considering. Uh, may be difficult to give full justice to the petition that's before us. So, it, it, as I said, if the committee members are so minded, certainly the local government and uh, regeneration committee will take it on board. But it's, it's whether or not it, it has the time uh, in the diary, because we've already diaried in our dates and our evidence sessions uh, if, in relation to the, the, the work ahead. Uh, so it would be uh, one of these areas where, yes, by all means, pass it on, but don't expect uh, to be full, detailed examination of the issues raised in the petition. Thank you. I could ask members who perhaps haven't spoken on in terms of next steps for the, where they could confirm what their views are on this. Um, David Torrance? I'm happy right. Recommendations. right. Yeah. Angus MacDonald? I have spoken, uh, convener, and I did say that I would be loath to okay. uh, close the petition as it does have okay. uh, some okay. merit, uh, right. particularly when you, right. you take into account um, major retailers are regarded as running roughshod yes. over independent retailers in certain mm. areas of the country. And Jackson Carl has spoken. Uh, Jim Eady? Um, for the reasons that have already been mentioned uh, by Mr Harvey and other right. members of the committee, I with the recommendation. Thank you. So um, we are agreeing by majority that we refer this petition to local government and regeneration committee um, so that they can look at this as part of the scrutiny and community empowerment Scotland bill and can I thank Patrick Harvey for coming along and making his submission and for the petitioners for all the work that they've done on this particular issue um, so thank you for that if I could just move on to the next petition it's PE 1500 by Stuart Houston OBE on behalf of RSPP Scotland on the Golden Eagle as the National Bird of Scotland, members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. Um, can I invite contributions um, from members? Jackson Carlo? 
Yes, I... Thank you, convener. I'm, we have received what I regard as a most commendable further letter from the minister who has reiterated, I think, very sensibly the point which I think I tried to make at an earlier submission that there is, in his mind, not a proven case regarding the general adoption of national symbols for this, that, and the next thing, or that secondly, were there to be one for a bird that there is a proven case in favour of any particular species. Um, so that I would really very much suggest, given that we've now had two letters from the Minister in which he has very emphatically <coughs> made that point, um, move that we close the petition. Now, I note that there is some consideration as to whether or not what might validate a subsequent opinion in all of this is a broader consultation. I have to say I'm not myself persuaded that the reach of the RSPB or the resource thereby is adequate. We've just, if you like, had a public consultation that engaged 3.6 million people. I'm not altogether sure that one which manages to engage a few thousand is, none, is nevertheless representative of anything. Uh, and I am concerned that the fundamental point that the Minister makes twice is the debate we have about the general adoption of national symbols. And in some ways, I think that there has to be some agreed conclusion about that before we then start consulting on what they might be and what they might be within what they might be. I take the point that you're making, Mr. Clown. I'm not sure if you're suggesting we should have had two questions a few weeks ago in the referendum about the <laughs> national bird on it or not. But, clearly, um, clearly a missed opportunity, <laughs> as Mr. Having said, says. Having said that, RSPB are a very large, if not the largest, membership organisation, and um, I, I personally have got uh, a very strong view that they are a very good organisation if they were going to carry out a consultation, they're the organisation have asked uh, to do it. But I know John Wilson wants to add his comments as well. Convener, thank you, and declare my membership of the RSPB in uh, this debate. And I think Mr. Carlo, I, while paraphrasing the Minister's letter, I think the Minister uh, says in the letter that, however, I am not convinced that a persuasive case has yet been assembled in favour of Scotland having a national bird or for the Golden Eagle to be that national bird. Then goes on to say that uh, you will be aware in the procedure that was devised for the Scots Pine designation, that process did involve some public consultation, and I believe that involving the public would be a vital part of any future procedure. As the convener has indicated, the uh, RSPB currently is one of the largest membership organisations in the United Kingdom, uh, if not Scotland. And I think it might be useful, convener, to keep the petition open and contact the petitioner to seek the petitioner's views on the minister's uh, letter with a view of asking whether or not the RSPB would be prepared to carry out a full consultation process along with their members and other organisations uh, to determine whether or not we could have the des designation of the Golden Eagle as a national bird. We are minded, uh, convener, that the debate on the Scots Pine while the minister did uh, originally indicate that he wasn't in favour of the Scots Pine, did, uh, after uh, consideration in a member's uh, motion to the parliament, agreed to the designation of the Scots Pine uh, as a national tree. So there has been uh, issues in the past that have been raised, and the minister has taken a view and relented on his original position and I think uh, it may be useful to write to the petitioner in this instance and seek their views and whether or not they would prepare, be prepared to carry out the necessary consultation as outlined by the Minister. Okay, can I ask other members? I invite Mr Carlo back later if he wishes to respond. Um, Amit Taggart. Thanks, Convener. Um, to continue the petition and as what Joan Wilson has indicated, um, for to ask the petitioner their views and moving forward. Thank you. David Torrance. Happy to go for recommendations. Um, Angus MacDonald. Yes, thanks. I'm, I'm certainly open to uh, clarification, but as, as I recall, I think a precedent was set uh, with regard to Scots Pine because the Forestry Commission themselves did conduct uh, a, a consultation. So, um, yeah, I, I, would, I would be happy to go along with uh, 
John Wilson's suggestion that we contact uh, the RSPB to see if they are willing to undertake a consultation and then Make a bring it decision. back. Sure. Yeah. And Jim Eady? I have no strong views yes. on the subject. Yeah. Um, Jackson Carlo, do you wish to come back on? I do, because I mean, I think you know, this is what the minister said, and I think maybe we have to write it into the record. There is also a wider discussion to be had about national symbols generally. What do we want of them, and what other types of national symbols might we want to consider? I recognise that we now have a national tree, the Scots pine. However, I feel that choosing these symbols is more than just the environmental or ecological question. It was for this reason that I expressed the hope that we might get a more rounded picture by asking other parliamentary committees for their views. I appreciate that you have done this and received some responses, but I would still prefer that we find a way of getting a considered view from the Parliament about the value and purpose of national symbols and hopefully avoid the potential for ending up with national symbols proposed and designated on what is essentially an ad hoc basis. Now, I think that is a very clear recommendation which goes beyond the scope of the immediate petition, which is why I believe that it should be closed. Um, and I think it's an interesting argument and consideration for Parliament to have. But I think it goes beyond the scope of this petition, which is why, I, of course, we do. I, I mean, I understand. I'm sort of trying to try and get some consensus because there is a basically there's a majority of the committee want to defer and ask RSPB for their view. I mean, if we wrote to them and they said, yes, we can do a consultation, not just on our own members, but for the, the Scottish public overall, um, and that we can do it under a conservative time scale, and the government's happy with that. Um, is that not something we could facilitate? And um, we could, if we get that positive note back, we can discuss this again at a future meeting. Well, obviously, I'm in the minority. I don't see how that addresses the issue as to whether or not we want these national symbols or not, which yeah. seems to me to be the minister's caveat prior to the consideration of adopting any particular mm. symbol for any particular thing. Mm. And I think that does go beyond the scope of the petition. So mm. even if the RSPB were to say, yes, we would, mm. I don't see how that really gets us beyond the Minister's consideration as mm. to whether or not we want national symbols. Sure. Well, can we put one final plea in terms of trying to get consensus? If they do come back in a positive note about running a consultation and the government is happy with the type of referendum that they're running, um, that then, I think, would resolve the issue that you're raising. Because that's what they did with the Scots Pine. Yeah, once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah, a lifetime opportunity. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm conscious of time. We probably could keep this going for a while, but I do know Jackson Carlow's um, opposition does, and I do, uh, I do understand that. I think the majority of the committee want us to defer this petition and ask RSPB whether they are able to run a consultation. I think we should... Once we get that back, I think we should check with Scottish Government what their views are and then take it from there. And we move on to the next petition. It's PE1501 by Stuart Graham on public inquiries into self-inflicted and accidental deaths following suspicious death investigations. Members of a note by the clerk's submissions. Could I invite contributions uh, from members? John Wilson. I mean, I'm minded um, as part of the recommendation to uh, refer this on to the Justice Committee uh, and allow them to uh, con consider it in terms of the, their ongoing considerations of other issues. So I would be minded okay. to refer it on. Could I ask other members for their views? Members agreeable with John Wilson's points? And uh, perhaps just for the record as well, if members are agreeable on that, um, you know, Mr Graham has put, I think, a lot of work in this petition and has put some very strong comments back. And if we could just quote one line, he said, it is, Mr Graham said he's dismayed by the lack of support for change in our system and feels that social justice doesn't apply to families um, of the bereaved. So I, he, I think he feels very strongly about this issue and I, I would welcome the views of the Justice Committee um, on this particular petition. Are members all agreeable or have members got a contrary view? Uh, Jackson Carlow? I'm not in any disagreement, but I have had constituents, I think other members may have had too, who have found themselves at odds with the system with regard to this. So in passing it on to the Justice Committee, I do so with actually a considerable amount of sympathy for the issues underlying the petition. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so then the decision of the committee then is to refer the petition to the Justice uh, Committee. Um, and also I think we should um, highlight the evidence that we received on the petition as well. Uh, could we move on to the next petition? It's PE1509 by Lee Wright on Aberdeen to Reness Real Travel Improvement. Members of a note by the clerk and submissions. Um, I think I, I raised uh, this issue last time round to raise a couple of points with Scottish Government. 
uh, particularly about uh, the duelling of rail, uh, both to Aberdeen and indeed to Glasgow Edinburgh. Uh, the lack of duelling causes real problems in the rail infrastructure uh, in, the ha in the Highlands and Islands. Um, and there's been a, um, a note back from the Scottish Government about this. Uh, Mr Lee also makes the point about uh, the lack of electrification north um, of Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, I don't suggest that we do anything further, bar note the points that uh, Mr Lee, uh, Wright made in a very, I think, very, very good uh, petition. Um, and um, I, I would suggest then that, um, that we close the petition on that basis that we've had a response, a final response from the Scottish Government. Is that agreeable? The next petition is PE1512 by Bill Chisholm on amendments to the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002. Um, members of a note by the clerk and the submissions could invite uh, contributions from members. John Wilson. Convener, the petitioner uh, quite clearly, and I'm just trying to find the, the comments, uh, raises a number of issues uh, in his submission regarding the, the comments made and the responses we received and it raises once again the fact that uh, the Freedom of Information Commissioner actually responded to this uh, petition before it actually went public on the Parliament's website. Uh, clearly, in my view, uh, there are some issues that are still outstanding in terms of how freedom of information requests are dealt with. And I think the petitioner was highlighting initially uh, the accuracy of the information provided by the body uh, where the information has been requested. Uh, and, I, and I don't think we've had that fully answered in any of the responses we've received today. I think there are still issues about trying to ensure that when a freedom of information request is uh, made that the information is accurate, up to date, yeah. and is relevant to the request <coughs> made by the requester in relation yeah. to that uh, FOI. So yeah. I, I, I'm not sure how we take it forward because clearly the Scottish Government, the Commissioner, and others are, are content with this current system uh, and whether or not uh, we, there is any scope for taking this much forward, I'm not sure. Yeah. Justin Carroll? I, I hear what John Wilson says, but given that the Scottish Government has said it doesn't propose to take it forward and agrees with the Scottish Information Commissioner, having raised the issues and explored them, I would have thought that if the Scottish Government is not prepared to take the matter forward, then there is no further progress we can make. And in those circumstances, whether I find it desirable or not in, as a response to the petition, it leads me to the view that we have no further course that we can pursue and therefore require to close it. The, um, I I read the Scottish Information Commissioner's annual report, and certainly um, they were making very strong comments about the failure of some public bodies to respond um, on freedom of information. So I think certainly the Information Commissioner is very clear on this problem, problem area. But I take Jackson Carroll's point. I think it's, a, again, a very good petition. It's just a case of I'm not sure where further we can take this. We've had a very st st strong steer from the government on this one. Are members agreeable then that that, um, that we close the petition on the basis that we've taken the petition as far as we reasonably can do so, but also thank the petitioner for the excellent work they've done in this particular area. Yeah, yes. that agreeable? Thank you for that. Um, the final current petition today is PE1463 by Lorian Cleaver on effective thyroid and adrenal testing, diagnosis and treatment. And I think the petitioner is in the gallery, if my glasses are correct. Um, and members have a note by the, the clerk. Um, Elaine Smith has had a long-standing interest in the petition, in the petition and can ask uh, if Elaine Smith would uh, like to make some uh, brief contributions to the committee. Thanks very much, convener. Um, I want to just start by thanking the committee for their continued interest in this issue and in the, the petition. Um, and I note the response that you've received from the Scottish Government, which does say that the listening exercise uh, would focus on the needs and experiences of those with thyroid disorders. So I think that's to be welcomed. Um, also note that the, the paper that you received from the petitioner, Lorraine Cleaver, has though uh, reiterated the, that, it would, um, that there would be value in a, a committee inquiry, 
even running alongside the exercise that the government's undertaking. So I just wish to continue to add my, my support to that suggestion. Um, in terms of a, a one-off session with um, sign, I think that it's up to the committee, obviously, whether the committee think that's useful. But um, I understand from the petitioner that the Healthcare Improvement Scoping Report, a recent report that was that was published um, points to thyroid function guidelines being based on poor quality evidence. So I think that the, you know, a session with sign might be helpful as well in taking forward uh, that issue. And as the petitioner notes in her uh, submission to you, there is um, more and more evidence, new evidence coming forward. So I think that that's extremely interesting. So thank you very much for your continued interest in these matters. Thank you, and thank you, Lynn Smith, um, and the petitioners again for um, this very, very thorough uh, petition. So, as members can see, there is a suggestion that we have a one-off evidence session with SIGN, the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network, which I'm sure you're all were aware of. Um, are members then agreeable that we go ahead and have that one-off evidence session? Thank, thank you for that. So we'll obviously uh, involve the petitioners in terms of letting them know when the meeting is. And obviously, if Elaine Smith wishes to attend that, she'd be very welcome. So that's the end of our um, formal public business. And we're now going into private session for a very brief item. And just have a few minutes for the gallery to clear. <laughs>